Hi, I'm Mike Maloney, and welcome to another CSRM podcast. Today's episode is hosted by Dr. Greg Glenville. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another CSRM podcast as we continue to work our way through the book, The Saving of Sports Ministry. My name is Dan Stofer. I'm joined today with Scott Steben and Dr. Greg Linville, the author of the book, And Dr. Linville, today we're going to talk about sports chaplaincy. And so chapter eight just really is all about that. And so I think a great place for us to start is first answering the question for those who may not know, what is a sports chaplain and why does it matter in soteriology and why does it matter in terms of the the whole concept of this book? So why don't you go ahead and dive in and explain some of that for us? Yeah, if people have not been with us up to this point or they don't have the book we're we're really trying to help people understand how to be more effective in their ministry of doing what they're set out to do and that is to actually go and make disciples and and we're we're banging this drum pretty loudly that it's more than just getting somebody to raise their hand or pray a prayer but that's that's a huge step we praise god when that happens, but we want that to be then the next step rather than the end step, and that there's steps after that, not to earn yourself salvation. We never do that. We 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 get salvation when we, when we accept the Lord Jesus as as our Lord and Savior, but then we kind of give evidence that we're saved by what we do after that. So we've talked about the para ministry worlds. And we've talked about local churches and we've talked about camping. And those are those are kind of three of the four main areas within the sports outreach community. And the fourth one has to do with chaplaincies and chaplains are typically people that have been invited or at least allowed into various locker rooms or in team complexes. I, I spent over 20 years in professional sports as a chaplain for a particular uh, sports franchise. And the first time that I walked in, the very first Sunday that I walked in, I literally turned the lights on. It was a minor league stadium. I turned the lights on and I woke up a guy sleeping on the floor. Welcome to the minor leagues. He didn't have enough money to even get an apartment or any place to live. And I won't go into the long story, but my, who became my very good friend, Danny Beaver, Dan, and I connected at that point. And he was the only one at the first chapel that we had. Now it grew from there and it, it grew over the 20 years where if I gave you names, they're in the hall of fame. They're the guys that came through that organization. It was really a very, very special time. But there's some things that we needed, we need to understand about this. The first one is that there's no substitute for church. Mm. And what do I mean by that? That the players will often say, They'll get up on a Sunday morning and they have to be at the at the stadium at a certain time. And they say to their wife or their significant other and their kids say, uh, take the kids to church. I'm going to go to the chapel. The typical sports ministry chapel in America is 10 to 20 minutes in length. There's a prayer. There's a short scripture that's read, and then there's some sort of communication. I wouldn't call it preaching. It might be teaching, but it's more testimonial, and it's more evangelistic. Give your life to Jesus. And if you, let's just say that, that over a season in football, you're there for 
you have eight or nine of those, maybe 10 with the preseason, and you get 10 minutes, 20 minutes, how can this replace church? It's not going to. And you say, oh, well, we do the weekly Bible study with them. Okay. But again, eight of them. And if it's an hour, there's no substitute for church. And typically what that happens is it, what happens is that it separates the player from their family or the coach or manager from their family. And there's all kinds of things that are wrapped up into this chaplaincy that are not seen right away. So if for instance, the manager of a baseball team or the coach of a football team, soccer team, if they show up at the chapel, what do you think about a lot of those players? They're going to show up because they think that's going to be way to playing time for them. You see, this is fraught with things. Mm. If the manager doesn't show up, then the players say, oh, they don't support it. I'm not going, even though they might want to. There's some difficulties with this chaplaincy in America. Now, a caveat, in the book, there's a whole section written by our very, very good friend. And, and Stuart Weir has been a sports chaplain. And the British model is a little bit different. They're there to serve. They're there. Not that Americans don't serve. But typically, American chaplains come in and they, they do that preaching, teaching thing. And they don't do anything else. The, the European British model does more of all these things, less on the preaching teaching, not that they're opposed to it. It's just a different model. So be aware of where you are in your in the world and in your culture of, of these different things. But no excuse, no substitute for church. Players get up early, go to the early service, take your kids, take your wife, take whatever, and get involved in a church. No excuse, no substitute. The second thing, there's no excuse and no substitute for radical discipleship, meaning you can't come to the chapel and just rub it like it's a rabbit's foot or a talisman or something. you got to really live for Jesus. Because if you've ever been in those settings, it doesn't take you very long to find the pornography is all over the locker room. And for the Christian, Declare, this is a no porno zone. Hmm. Anybody doesn't want porno, we're in this section. In the restroom, in the locker room, wherever. I, there's a radicalness that needs to come. And then there's other things that the expectations that the team that you're a chaplain from, particularly if you're, you're in professional sports or you, you're Division I college football, if you're not helping my team win, we don't want you as the chaplain. So let's don't talk about that other stuff. Let's talk about what it really means to play hard and, and to do this and do well and all of that. And then you have the expectations of the players and the coaches themselves. And that is the same kind of thing. Are you helping me get a position, get a better contract? Get, get more playing time. And then, uh, I hate to say this, but we also have to talk about the expectations of the chaplain themselves. Mm. Because are you there so you can tell who you got an autograph from? Are you there to get an autograph? Mm. In all of those 20 years, I never got an autograph. I take that back. I got one because the guy forced it on me. I only got tickets to a game once because the guy said, you won't let me do anything for you. You do everything for me. He said, you either take these tickets or I'm not coming anymore. <laughs> You've got to understand that you go to serve. Mm -hmm. You don't go and tell everybody, oh, I know so-and-so, and I know so-and-so. Check your own motives, sports chaplains. Are you there for you? Are you there because these folks need Jesus? And there's no substitute then for Jesus. There's nothing else 
but getting these folks Jesus. Guys, pick up on any of it. Hmm. Greg, I think, again, like we've talked about with other paraministry organizations and the local church, if, if there's an intentional plan, there's great opportunity. Yes. I, I think on two levels. One, because you have experienced this and your perspective matters. When you get into the locker room, that's a sacred place. Um, I never played D1 or any sort of pro sports, but I, I know that the locker room is a very sacred place. And so you played high school, you played college, you get it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if somebody comes in there from the outside and they show that they actually care yes. and yes, they're sharing the gospel, but they care about me. And like you said, they want to help me win or they care about me winning at life, which obviously salvation is the best way to win at life. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, I'm going to respect that person. And there's an opportunity. And so I, I think that perspective certainly helps. And then again, here comes the, the local church. If if we're thinking about, if we really want to uh, influence our world, we'll recognize there are chaplains out there who are ministering to people in the minor leagues or pro sports or D1 college athletics. Those athletes, those men and women have a huge platform for the sake of the gospel. Why would we not, as a local church sports minister or just a local church in general, why would we not be open to some sort of partnership uh, of, of pouring into that chaplain and making sure that chaplain has what they need, of partnering some way? And then the chaplain recognizing, okay, hey, this church has taken a good interest in what I'm trying to accomplish here. Mm -hmm. And so I need to send the athlete to that church. So I think, yeah. again, it's an overall partnership. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, in fact, I'll take it a step further. I I ran afoul of one of the pro chaplain ministries because I said that they should not place a chaplain in any of the professional teams that they were working with who was not from a local church and that the local church needed to get involved. And I have served everything from a middle school chaplain all the way up to the professional ranks. And in those 20 some years at the professional ranks, we were part of a church and it was part of the church's mission. And people from the church then got involved in lots of different ways. And it, again, it, it, at the minor league level, at least, that the players often need a place to stay. People from the church opened up their homes. People served the spouses and children. Mm -hmm. When the player was on the road, they got them involved in all kinds of things. And people got involved in the church. And so the church has to be willing to do it, like we said last time. But the, but the paraministries, they need to do this because this is what really gets somebody in that growth area to become a dedicated disciple. So sports chaplaincy, we love it. We would recommend that every single church sports minister who's listening to this, is reading this chapter, hearing about this, that you try to get yourself in a chaplaincy position within any of these teams, your local high school, your college, a professional team, and serve those people and get them involved in your church. That's what we're recommending. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a strong challenge yet again to uh, to see more dedicated disciples made. I, I'm thinking about just, just the past week. Um, I'm a big uh, fan of uh, the Ohio State University. And unfortunately, they lost. Yes, I yeah. am. Uh, and unfortunately, they lost to Michigan in their rivalry game. Uh, but I heard their quarterback uh, share his his faith at at the uh, press conference post game. I mean, and he was very uh, emotional. Just lost this big game, but he he thanked Jesus Christ. And so there's an opportunity. There's a D one college level mm -hmm. high candidate who's sharing his faith. And I, I have no idea if he's associated with any chaplain or any local church here in Columbus, but what an opportunity 
um, because of his platform. If there is someone pouring into his life who is a chaplain, or if there is a local church here in Columbus who's saying, all right, any any Ohio State football player is welcomed. And we don't want you just to come because you're famous. We want you to come because we want to serve you. I think that potential partnership is is huge. I watched some pro games yesterday and I saw guys with crosses uh, with their with their eye black on their face during their, mm. their game. So they're at least expressing that they may or may not be a Christian. And so, again, I think about that that chaplain with that pro sports team. There's there's opportunity. And so, Greg, I think this takes sports ministry to a whole new level if there are intentional plans and in, and very intentional relationships being built, which is one of our R's at CSRM. We want to see this happen in yes. the sports focused community, because if we're intentional, <laughs> what God can do with the gospel is, is just so mind blowing. And the people that, that we can reach, because we do live, if we're honest, in a very sports crazed society. And so, okay, we can push against that and look at all that's wrong with it. And there are a lot of things that are wrong. Or we can embrace it by saying, okay, I may never be able to get in a locker room, but there's a chaplain who can, and I need to support them and then build bridges to make sure that we can make more disciples. And so I think it's a healthy challenge. I think um, uh, probably an opportunity for us to have some final words here because we are running out of time. But uh, I think chapter eight is a very intriguing chapter for all of us to consider. So Men, let's have some final words here as we wrap up this episode and as we prepare for the next. What do you got, Scott? Oh man, there's just it, it's all good. Like, I mean, I don't it's it's one of those things where just listening to this episode, but then also all the ones we've done with this book, it's it's stuff that makes sense. It's stuff that's very basic, and yet it seems like it's also the same things that we as ministers continue to lose sight of because we get so caught up in the logistics and or we get caught up in the program that we forget the basic fundamentals of what we need to be doing. Well, final words, Dan, would be that we've got like one more kind of topic to go, and that is how do we how do we work out this? How do we apply the soteriological concepts in a multi-faith world? And we're going to talk about that both in the Western culture where it's it's not as acceptable as it once was, but also in parts of the world where you can go to your death for it. And and then we're going to uh, we're going to kind of wrap up, <clears throat> excuse me, with some overall summaries of it and then also there's a there's a postscript in a book that helps people know how they can empower their local church sports ministers their local church sports missionaries to actually engage in these evangelistic conversations with people through the sports ministries whether it's chaplaincy or camps or local church leagues or whatever and so there's some things there that can be a real pragmatic help to, to the local church sports rec and fitness minister. So we've got a couple more to go, and then we'll have another book all wrapped up. And it is a, a great resource, The Saving of Sports Ministry. Mm -hmm. And we would encourage you to go to our website, purchase a copy if you haven't already. Purchase several copies because you can see how this could really lend itself to some great conversations with your leadership, with your local church missionaries, uh, volunteers, but we don't call them that. But you have an opportunity to have a larger conversation to really develop an overall plan yes. uh, for your local church sports ministry. And then you see, like our conversation here today, how it can go way outside of the four walls of your church, which is what we want. And, and my final challenge, my, my final words here, uh, this will be released, this podcast episode near Christmas. And so the year is ending up. And we always are very um, introspective as we end a given year and as we prepare for a new year. And we would just encourage you, think about strategy. Think about strategy. Think about partnerships. 
Think about what you can do with your sports ministry beyond what you're currently doing if you just had some time to plan and to dream. And so my encouragement, our challenge is take that time. Get away, pray fast, get a pen and paper, start to write down just some different thoughts based upon some conversations that you will have from this book to move from someone who just comes to Christ, which is awesome, very important. Salvation is found in no one else but Jesus Christ, but moves then beyond that to a dedicated disciple and how you can help develop structure to make that happen. Some partnerships to go beyond your church to be most effective in sports ministry. And so that's our encouragement. That's all the time we have here today. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us and we'll catch you next time. Take care. The CSRM Podcast is a production of CSRM and their production house, Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville is the executive producer and Scott Stedman is the associate producer and editor. To learn more about CSRM, visit csrm.org. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. The CSRM Podcast is the flagship member of the podcast network, Overwhelming Victory Radio. For more information on Overwhelming Victory Radio or to listen to our partner podcasts, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash OV Radio. For CSRM Podcasts, I'm Mike Maloney. Have a blessed day.